This is Xi Ting welcoming you to Backstage, the life behind the music. This is an online series of conversations with pianists, an exploration of their remarkable artistic lives as performers, teachers, and advocates for music. Through talking, I hope to shed some light on their process, to get a glimpse into some of their music making, the real work that takes place before they or their students step out onto the stage. Do you have any a formative experience that you would like share as a musician? Yeah, well, I, I grew up in Northern California, in Santa Rosa, California. And um, when I was a kid, uh, my mother really wanted to, one of, one of her lifelong dreams was to learn, try to learn the piano. And so uh, when I was a kid, um, there was this upright piano that happened to be um, rented from my mom. And she's ho- she was hoping that one of her kids would, uh, would learn. And um, when it arrived that day, when I was seven, I thought it was the coolest, most interesting box ever. Um, I had no idea how to play it, but there are these things underneath, these things called the pedals that you could press down and then you could bang on the, you know, the lower part of the piano and you can make these sort of thunder and lightning sounds. And I, I found that to be really fascinating. And um, even the look of it, I thought was really beautiful. So my mom was thrilled that I would learn piano with her when I was seven. And um, the other thing that I got really lucky with when I was a kid was that we had this great local teacher named Lynn Jendo, who's from Indonesia. And um, she taught me from, you know, from age, I don't know, eight to uh, 12. And she was, she, she just saw music as this really creative, fascinating thing. And her lessons were just really fun and, and really interesting. She gave me all these fun pieces to play. And I, I thought, wow, this is really great. And, you know, when I first started learning music, I, of course, didn't want to practice. All I wanted to do was play my own little pieces. And I had no idea how to write any of this down. And I had no idea what a note was. And she, in a wonderful way, was, was patient enough with me to spend time to help me to write these pieces out. And she encouraged me to compose and so forth. And so I was very lucky to have this as a first memory of learning the piano. Um, and then maybe two years after that, in, uh, when I was nine, um, I, I remember it um, really well. Um, it was a Sunday morning and my dad woke me up really early. He said, you know, there's this pianist on TV. You have to come downstairs and see. And I was very angry that I had to wake up so early on a Sunday morning. But nevertheless, I went downstairs and the pianist on TV was Vladimir Horowitz. And it was his 1986 Moscow concert, which was being uh, broadcast. And for me, it was really something special because I saw this elderly man playing music for this, this packed concert hall and everyone was at the edge of their seats listening to what this person had to say with his music. And not only that, sometimes the cameras um, would focus on someone in the audience. And I I noticed that some people were weeping and some people were sort of in meditation. And as a nine-year-old, I thought, man, I want that. That's amazing. I had no idea that music could actually be that profound as a, you know, but when I saw that as a nine-year-old, I just thought that is incredible. There's some magic there. There's something there that I, I had no idea existed. And I think since then I was hooked and um, it, it continues to be something that um, I, I love to this day. A lot of people know you have a very active profile as a contemporary music lover and you uh, promote that very much. I was wondering what started your fascination with that? Uh, well, it, I mean, it kind of, it kind of comes back, you know, like, um, if you were to, if I was to invite like three people out to coffee, and let's say one person's a scientist, and one person's a biologist, and the third person's a pianist, and if I was to ask them, 
you know, what are, tell me what's going on in your field now that really excites you. And, and the, you know, the, the biologist could tell me, you know, oh, there's this great new gene therapy that's happening. It's really fascinating. Then the doctor would tell me about this, that, and the other. The scientist would tell me, you know, we have this, we're, we're going to, we're going to defeat cancer because of these new, these, these, these new things that are going on in our field. But if then you talk to the pianist and you say, what's new in your field? A lot of times, unfortunately, that pianist cannot tell you. And I've always found that to be like sort of strange that we live in a contemporary society. We live in 2020 and it seems strange not to be at least curious what's going on now in your environment, you know? Um, and so I guess I've always kind of been um, that, that person that when I go into an art museum, of course I, I spend time in, you know, some of the galleries that have more conservative or landscape paintings that make me feel good, but then I'm more drawn to the paintings that I don't kind of understand that cause a, a kind of a reaction. And I, I enjoy that, you know, um, because I, I find to be like traveling to a, a different country, you know, it's full of different kinds of things. So, I mean, contemporary music has always been something that I've been uh, fascinated with for so many years. Um, and it, it's something that luckily in grad school, I had teachers that really encouraged me, you know, this, this music was something that I, I felt really passionate about and I felt really emotionally connected to, and they encouraged that. And um, that's something that I was just really lucky to have these encouraging teachers. But the thing is, um, when you play a lot of contemporary music and then you come back to the standard repertoire, you see it as something new. So when you, because you spend so much time looking at something and premiering something, then when you go back to Beethoven, you see Beethoven as a new piece of music. Because if you think about it, all pieces at some point were, was all new. I mean, uh, all, you know, it's strange to think about, but the Goldberg variations years ago, there's a premiere, you know, the Chopin's fourth ballad, there was a premiere at some point, you know, all these pieces. And I think when you see the music as like with this fresh perspective and you see it in the guise or the filter of contemporary music, instead of the filter of like schnabel or something else, then you, you see it as like something really can be really creative and different. And um, so now, um, now that I'm older, I, I still play a lot of contemporary music, but I see Beethoven and Bach um, more like fellow people rather than these gods, you know, um, they're, they're just these uh, creative souls that are trying to uh, figure out how they relate to society and figure out how they can talk about their condition through music. Yeah, it's so wonderful that you're so open and so curious about new music. How do you approach a student that's stubborn and conservative about new music. Yeah. Well, um, I, I mean, I meet a lot, <laughs> a lot of these people everywhere and it's, it's not their fault. I, I think it's, it's mostly the fault of conservatories. Conservatories themselves tend to be conservative. And uh, by that, I mean, um, they focus on the standard repertoire, which is so important and amazing, it's beautiful music and it's music that we all should consider, but they ignore anything after 1960 and anything that is before J.S. Bach. And so I find, I find that to be um, not good. And I, I find that to be something that a lot of conservatories are slowly changing, but um, so forth. So anyway, to answer your question, I, I think, when I deal with those kinds of students, I like to think of it a little bit like um, how we deal with food. So years ago, um, I was a really picky eater, and I, but I liked Chinese food for some reason. But it wasn't the real Chinese food that you get in China. It was like Americanized Chinese food. But I still thought it was great. And then someone mentioned, you know, there's a thing called Thai food. 
And there's some similarities between, you know, Thai food and Chinese food. They both have stir fry, but in Thai food, there's a thing, they have these curries. So I, you know, I had, I felt enough connection with the fact that I like Chinese food with the stir fry thing. Then I tried the curries. I loved it. And then because I love Thai food and I could stomach these curries, then Indian food was something that was like really great. And then you, you know, anyway, you can continue that story that way. And I think when I meet students that are a little bit scared of contemporary music, I start from where they are. So like if someone's from China, I try to take their background. Like if someone's from China, for instance, let's, let's use that culture. Let's talk about music that's from their country and from their culture and let's go further. Or another student that is really interested in the music of Debussy or Ravel, why not give them a piece um, uh, by, you know, someone like, a, it could be Messian, could be Due to You. And then after Due to You, how about some Boulez? And after, after Boulez, how about some Marai? But the point is that you don't want to give a piece to a student um, just haphazardly. You want to make sure that there's some connection in the beginning so that the student can connect to it emotionally. That's, I think, the most important thing. But it's also the professor's job to, to d do his or her homework. They have to know if there's a, a piece by Steve Reich that they're doing that this is important because of this, that, and the other. Just like they would know why Beethoven's Opus 110 is important. They have to know the context of the music. And I, I think there's an incredible context of all these contemporary pieces that are are there for people to explore. So I would, I would start with that. I mean, you got to start with just something that they know and then get them a little bit out of their comfort zone. Something I did last year, which was a little bit of an experiment, but I, I enjoyed it. Um, as every year at UMKC, um, I'll have a, a studio project for my students. And each year we deal with like a different aspect. And last year we dealt with um, pieces for piano and electronics. The whole concert was, um, sh it showed the history of piano and electronics. And that's sort of a short history, just from 1970 up into the future. But the challenge for me was devising a program that number one, showed this, you know, this history. And then number two, found pieces that would connect with each student so that, you know, because it's challenging for them because number one, it's a new language. Number two, it's a new technology that they have to figure out how to place within their wheelhouse, you know? And so um, uh, that, was a, that was a program that I, I enjoyed doing. I hope my students enjoyed it too, but I started with the idea that I would, would give them a piece that would challenge them, but not challenge them you know, too much, they would, they would feel kind of comfortable. And I think that's sort of the secret with trying to help students who, who don't want to do it, <laughs> something like that. You mentioned Messian's uh, music. I know that uh, you've been a huge fan of his music and you also studied with his second wife, Yvonne L'Oreal Messian. I was wondering if you can talk a little more about that. Sure. Well, um, how I got to know his music is also really haphazardly. Um, we used to have these things called CDs. I don't know if you know what they are, but in high school, uh, you know, there was no internet yet. And uh, we had CDs and there was a record store where um, there was a, this like this bin of used CDs, you know, that they were just trying to get rid of. And there was this used uh, two CD set of uh, this composer named Messian and this piece called the Vin Regards Sur la Fonte Jésus, 20 Visions of the Infant Jesus. And I bought it for five bucks and I brought it home and I listened to it and I thought it was the most strange and fascinating and violent music that I've ever heard up until then. I had no idea what to make of it, but it was so interesting because it, the language was, was something that I've never heard before and it fascinated me, although I was very perplexed by it, you know, but there was moments of it which intrigued me so much. I, I kept on listening to it to try to figure out what is this guy going for? And then I read that, you know, he's, 
he's trying to create metaphors for his Catholicism and he's obsessed with bird calls and all these things were really fascinating, you know. Um, again, it was something that was really new to me. And then when I went to college, when I went away to college, someone told me about the Quartet for the End of Time, which blew my mind, and uh, Turangalila Symphony, which blew my mind. And eventually I started playing his music. And um, in 2003, when I was at Eastman, there was a fellowship that you could apply for. And it was basically, um, it was called the Presser Foundation. And it was a pretty large uh, amount of money. And with that money, you can do whatever you wanted. So it was like a, a blank check. And I thought that was great. And I, I thought, wow, I would love to, if I had to, you know, if I, if I had a dream, boy, it would be great to be able to live in Paris and study with Madame Messiaen. And I, I thought it was a crazy idea at the time, but I thought, yeah, I might as well try, you know, who knows? The worst they can say is no. Well, somehow, luckily, they said yes. And then I, um, I received this fellowship. And then I wrote to Madame Messiaen in French. And I said, you know, I won this fellowship to come and study with you. Can you, will you accept me as your student? I sent her a CD. And luckily, she wrote back and said, yes, we can work together. And um, that was wonderful. And then when I eventually arrived in Paris after all this time, I stupidly just called her on the phone and I, I figured, well, I'm sure she can speak English because, you know, everyone can speak English. But I called her on the phone and I started, you know, speaking with her a little bit in French. And she's like, oh yeah, we, 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 yeah, Thomas, yeah. And then it turns out she can't speak English at all. So we had this unbelievably awkward conversation on the phone and all I was trying to do was set up our first piano lesson. Anyway, I wrote her a letter and we eventually were able to meet and start lessons. What was amazing about Yvonne Lorio is that when I met her, she was, you know, she was an older lady in her 80s, but when we studied her husband's music, she she thought of it as as this creative, interesting music and she was so excited to talk about it. And she was so excited to um, discover it with me, even though like the Van Regards, for instance, she premiered in 1944. And so she's been living with this music for so long. And you'd think that she wouldn't, you know, she would have nothing really interesting to say about it or, you know, or she wouldn't see it as something new and vibrant, but that was totally not the case. Every lesson was like this discovery into her husband's music in really interesting ways. And so that was exciting to me. And not only that, it was her obsession with how I voiced chords and how I thought of the timbre of um, playing the piano. And so a lot of Messian's music has to do with the color and you know, how it relates to other aspects of the music. And she would spend long hours on just how to get just the exact um, right sound. Um, and then the other wonderful thing about it is she spoke about all these really great metaphors for husband's music and how this is like this and this is, you know, this part in this piece is the mother's womb and this is the baby Jesus who's stirring in, uh, in Mary. All these wonderful metaphors that you would never get until you, you study it in that way. So the whole experience was, was, was really wonderful for me and um, it, it continues to inspire me today. I was wondering if you could talk to us a little about what sparks your interest in having an active career as a teacher and performer in China. Yeah, well, China, as we all know, is, is growing in these incredible, incredible ways. And uh, luckily, uh, 15 years ago, I, I started going to China and I, I continue to go there a lot and uh, love it um, and for so many reasons. But um, when I first went there 15 years ago, what I realized is that when I looked out into the audience, I noticed that most of the people in the audience were young people. It was children and college kids. And as we know in the West, when you look out to a concert hall, mostly it's it's aging or elderly people. So there, there's some difference there, but in China, it's completely the opposite of the West. 
And for me, when I noticed that, I realized, wow, something, something's going on here. Something's really different. And so um, there, there's, a, there's a fascination with classical music over there that's incredible. And then I guess in 2008, I started going over there to teach and to play. And during the master classes, I realized that um, the, the teachers of the student would come and the, the entire, sometimes the entire family of the students would come. The father would come and take a video of the lesson. The mother would be writing notes and they took it so unbelievably serious. And I, I thought, wow, that's, that's really something. They really, they really want to learn something. And it, it wasn't that um, I was something special or anything like that, but they were really open to someone else's perspective. And um, I really appreciated that. I've always felt like the conservatories in China, they're so open to new ideas and exploration. And I, I've always felt this welcomeness from the conservatories and the professors there. And I always thought that was really um, exciting and wonderful. And the last thing, most recently, I, China is opening in incredible ways. I mean, all the stuff that we're talking about, the importance of uh, contemporary music and the importance of not just that, but just being, trying to understand that music doesn't just stop at 1960. Well, China is really aware of that. I mean, 10 years ago, all the students who would play for me it was standard repertoire it was Chopin and Beethoven, and the usual suspects. But most recently it's, you know, uh, Ligeti and Dutiu and all these other composers that are making their way to China. And I find that to be really encouraging. And um, I think it's just a lot of great things to say about China, how open it is and how, how it's changing so rapidly. One thing about young artists that we're talking about, do you agree that for young artists to stand out in today's society, that we must establish a unique profile for ourselves? Yeah, I mean, I think there's two sides to that question. I think if, if someone is just doing something for novelty, I, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. You know, someone wants to do some kind of crazy project just to get a thousand likes on Instagram or whatever. I wouldn't necessarily agree with that, but I think what, if you're nurtured with someone who, under, who understands you as a person, eventually all the things that make you you are going to come out. Music is basically a filter for your life experience in some ways. So if, you, if someone finds that or tries to bring that out in your in your uh, development, eventually that will come out. But it, it kind of comes back to what we were talking about before, about being aware of all these different possibilities. But I think the thing that scares me is that a lot of pianists might graduate from a great conservatory thinking that there's one way to do something, that there's one way to be a pianist, that there's one way to play Beethoven, that there's one way to think about this. And I, I think that's not the, the goal of a conservatory. I think the goal of the conservatory is to show that there's many different ways and you have to find your own path through that. So I, I think all this will naturally happen if the student has an open mind and really can look inside of themselves and say, look, I, I have this thing that I, I do that I care really about and I, I want to share that, you know. I, I think if you're concerned with um, trying to prove yourself, um, it's, that's a whole different problem. If I can just, this reminds me of a quote that um, I love um, by Yo-Yo Ma. I, I remember I, I saw a master class of his um, years ago and he said something which I hope I'm quoting him right, but someone like a, a young kid in the audience asked him, Mr. Mr. Yo-Yo, what, what do you think about when you play music? And he said simply, when I play music, I try to share my understanding of this music instead of trying to prove my understanding of the music. You see, if you try to share your own perspective, it's really you and it's, it's unique. But if I try to prove that I'm 
that I know what I'm doing, it totally changes the situation. And I think he was really on to something. So to sort of get back to your question, I, I think if you, if you look inward and you're surrounded by mentors that will help you to bring that out, I, I think it will only naturally come out. Thank you so much for talking with me. And it's been so refreshing to hear your perspective and to hear how open you are about contemporary music and how we can approach contemporary music more easily in the future. And it's also very uh, interesting to hear your story growing up and your formative experiences. Um, thank you. And I hope you stay well at this time. Thank you so much for having me. It's so nice to speak with you. Take care. <laughs>